So I want to say welcome again to our seventh tutorial. We only have one left after this. Um, I'm sure all of you received my email about the brain dissection following the, the next tutorial. Do try and attend it if you can. If you are very squeamish, I understand. I think it's something that one doesn't always have a stomach for. Um, especially as psychologists, we're not medically trained. We're not used to working with cadavers and that kind of thing. But it really is, if you're working in neuropsychology, it's such a privilege to be able to say you've actually seen how a brain looks in real life and what it looks like when you open it and so on. So I invite you to come and join us for that. Just let Tanya know if you're going to be joining us. Um, I have quite a lot that I need to cover today, so, but for those of you who are already doing neuropsychological assessments, you'll find a lot of this is common sense. So in that sense, it's quite easy. But before I talk about the neuropsychological assessments itself, I'm going to talk about the differences between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and between male brain and female brains. All right. So let's look at the left versus right hemisphere. While they are very similar in many ways, there are important anatomical differences. And the first is that the right hemisphere is slightly larger and heavier than the left. The left cortex is thicker. The left hemisphere contains relatively more gray matter. And the right hemisphere extends further anteriorly than does the left. So you can see in this picture here, this is looking at the brain from the bottom. So this, this picture is upside down. So this is the right hemisphere here. And you can see it extends a little bit further anteriorly than the left hemisphere. And the left hemisphere extends further posteriorly than the right. Okay, just some interesting differences. Now the sylvian fissure, which is this fissure here dividing the temporal lobe from the frontal and parietal lobe, um, the lateral sylvian fissure is longer in the left hemisphere than the right and has a gentler slope. Hence, the temporoparietal cortex ventral to that of the fissure is larger on the right. So if you look, here's the right hemisphere. So it goes up more sharply and it's a bit shorter. So this area here, the temporoparietal area, is larger on the right compared to the left. Okay. Now, the left side of the brain has a larger insula. Now, you remember in this picture, if you, you can actually, you will see now, if you come for the brain dissection, you'll see you can actually pull apart that part of the brain. And you can take a look in there. You can see here they use fork-like things to just pull it apart. And the left side is a larger insula. insula. The insula is that part inside there. The left side is a wider occipital lobe. The right side is a wider frontal lobe. And the left occipital horn of the lateral ventricle is longer. And I've put this picture in here just to remind you where the ventricles are. Okay. Now, the left, just sort of, just more differences, anatomical differences between left and right. The left has a larger medial temporal lobe. The left has a larger temporal planum, or planum temporal. And I've put this picture in here, just so that you can see where the planum is. This is the left side. You can say this is bigger than the right side over there. Okay. Here's another picture of the planum temporal. The right side has a double Heschel's gyrus in the primary auditory cortex. Here's a gyrus, the Heschel's gyrus here. So the right side is a double Heschel's gyrus. The right side also has a larger medial geniculate nucleus. Now you remember the medial geniculate nucleus is in the thalamus. And I've put this picture in again. You should be familiar with this picture. It's just to remind you where the medial geniculate nucleus is. And the right has a larger area of, the, of convexity of the frontal operculum. This is a frontal operculum over there. Okay. Um, you'll see there's the, the label, operculum frontal. Now, I've put these pictures in because if you read it just like that in, in, the, the, you know, in the books, it can sound a little bit overwhelming. Now... Le something that, that is very important for us to know, we, we all know that left side is verbal and right side is non-verbal and so on, but we must be very careful not to be too absolute about this um, because laterality is relative. And, for example, the right hemisphere also has some language functions, particularly your, your prosody, etc. And the cerebral site is at least as important as the cerebral side. So, for example, frontal compared to parietal areas. 
and laterality is affected by genetic and environmental factors because we know the more, depending on what activity we do and so on, there might be um, strengthening of, of certain, as certain parts compared to others and there's a genetic component to it. Now you'll read quite a bit about handedness. I've put in three pictures of three famous people who happen to be left-handed, just for interest sake. And they, you get two populations of left-handers. And if your patient is left-handed, it's important to ask them about this. Are they familial left-handers? Do they have people in their family that are left-handed? Parents, grandparents, and so on. So is it a genetic thing? Or are they non-familial left-handers? Because if they're left-handed and there isn't a family history of it that can be clearly identified, um, it is possible that they're left-handed because there was some brain damage causing the functions to move over to the other side. Okay, so you need to always ask about family history of left-handedness if you have a left-handed patient. <clears throat> you will read about the WADA test, and the WADA test is where there's carotid sodium amobarbital injected into the brain, and the one hemisphere is anesthetized. And you'll read about a lot of experiments that were done with a WADA test because if they can anesthetize the one hemisphere, they can get a sense for what the other hemisphere does or doesn't do. And you'll read quite a bit about this. But um, just about handedness and speech again, this is very important because sometimes there's the assumption that if you're, um, obviously if you're right-handed, then language is on your left as it should be. But there's often the assumption that if, you, if you're left-handed, then your language is on the right-hand side. And that's, that's far oversimplified. So if we look at this, these statistics, 98% of right-handers show st speech disturbance when the left hemisphere is anesthetized, but not the right. So that makes sense because your, most of your right-handers are going to have their language in the left hemisphere. 70% of left-handers show speech disturbance when the left hemisphere is anesthetized, but not the right. Okay, so most left-handers also have most of their speech on the left. Like as right-handers do. 2% of right-handers have speech functions lateralized to the right hemisphere. So if somebody is right-handed, don't assume that they will automatically have all their language abilities on the left. But there's a very, very small percentage of people who would have it on the right. No right-handers showed bilateral speech organization, and 15% of left-handers showed significant speech dis disturbance after either sides were anesthetized. So your left-handed people tend to have language on both sides. Okay, most, many of them. Let's look at the differences between, between male and female brains. Again, there isn't a huge difference, but there are some significant differences. There are differences in behavior as a result of different brain structures. So in terms of um, motor skills, apparently men are better at throwing things, and women are better at fine motor skills. Okay. In terms of spatial analysis, men, men are good at ro mental rotation of objects and spatial navigation more than women, whereas women are better at spatial memory. Mathematical aptitude, men are better at mathematical reasoning. Remember, it's not generally. Um, women at mathematical, mathematical computation. Perception, men are better at mechanical drawings, whereas women are better at the perception of facial expressions and body posture. And then under verbal abilities, Women are better at verbal fluency and verbal memory than men, and under aggression, men tend to be more aggressive. Okay, because of testosterone, I'm sure. Now, anatomical differences in the brain. So those are behavioral differences, and there are, t are anatomical differences. Men have larger medial frontal areas, larger cingulate areas, larger amygdala and hypothalamus, larger overall white matter volume, larger cerebral ventricles, larger right plenum parietal, and I've just put in, um, which is part of the supramarginal gyrus, and I've just put in a picture again reminding you where the supramarginal gyrus is, and more neurons overall, and they have larger brains overall. Females have larger language areas, they have larger medial or paralimbic, paralimbic areas, um, larger lateral frontal areas, relative a greater relative amount of gray matter, more densely packed neurons in the temporal lobe, more gyri, and a thicker cortex. 
This is just a diagram just to remind you of the different hemispheres and their particular functions. So have a look at that when you're studying. Now I'm going to talk about neuropsychological assessment, this thing that we all do. It's, all, it's very important to have a good understanding of anatomy, physiology, all of these things. Ultimately what we do on neuropsychological assessments and there's some important things we need to know about that. Um, never, never, never use tests in isolation. Don't just do some tests and think you've now got the answers. You must also make use of medical documents like hospital notes, brain scans. Collateral information is very important. Speak to spouses, children, parents. Um, evidence of pre-morbid functioning is important, like school reports. Clinic, your clinical observations are particularly important and you get better and better at it the more you do neuropsychological assessments. And understanding the patterns in anatomy and pathology. So that if you're suspecting there's a certain pathology, you understand, need to understand the patterns of it um, in, and how it's going to appear in your testing so that you can work out this whole bigger picture before you form an opinion. Never form an opinion on tests alone. You need to ask yourself, what is the assessment for? And there are many different reasons why somebody might be referred to you to be assessed. And you need to choose the test depending on what, what you're being referred for. Um, for example, is it the ability to drive? In which case, you won't necessarily do a full battery of tests. You might just do some selected tests. Is it um, to aid a diagnosis? And you need to know, well, what is the probable diagnosis? Let's see if we can add these tests to get a clearer, clearer understanding. Are you looking at previous post-morbid differences, like in road accident fund or medical negligence claims? In which case, you need to make sure you include, include tests and collateral and so on that's going to give you information about pre-morbid abilities. Okay. So you need to decide, why, why am I doing this assessment before you actually do it? Very importantly, you need to keep in mind differential diagnosis. It, many things look like other things, and you need to make sure that what you think it is isn't actually something else. Okay? So the way Lizak puts it is, which of two or more diagnostic pigeonholes best suit the patient's behavior? And examples of where this is important is where there's impaired spatial ability or motor ability. You know, so a lot of our tests of visuospatial ability requires motor movement. So if somebody does badly in that test, is it because there's a motor problem or because there's a visuospatial problem? Um, does a person have dyslexia that they struggle to read or just poor memory of for what they've read? You know, if you ask them to read something and to tell you what they read, is it because they can't remember what they read or because they weren't able to read it? Dementing disorders versus normal aging. Alzheimer's or frontotemporal dementia. Depression or dementia. Often depression and dementia look very similar, but there's some important differences. How do you, how do you, how do you know? How can you tell if somebody has Alzheimer's disease or has depression or dementia? There's a, there's a oh, I think it's in Lisek. There's a, one, a very good table. Um, if you can't find it in Lisek, ask me for it, where they actually set it out, the two differences. One of the main differences is a, something that has to do with your observation. The depressed patient is eager to tell you there's something wrong with them and that they're having memory problems. The person with dementia thinks there's nothing wrong with them. So that's one of the telltale signs. But there is a very nice table. And if you can't find it, just ask me for it. I'll send it to you. Now, the process of a neuropsychological assessment, as I said, a lot of this is common sense, and if you've been doing neuropsychological assessments, this should be quite easy. You get your referral, you choose your tests. Some psychologists prefer to use a set battery of tests on each patient. I, I, that, that's one way to do it. Um, I prefer to choose, select the test for, depending on what you, you want answered. You prepare the assessment, so you get all of your things together. You don't want to be testing the patient and then realize you don't have a feedback form or you don't have a, the, man, you know, the, the um, stimulus booklet or something like that. You get everything together, you prepare your client. You explain to him what you're going to do, what happens with this information, you get their consent, etc. You do the interview with a patient and all collateral separately, usually. Um, then you test the person, you score it, and you carefully choose the norms that you're going to use, put a lot of thought into that. Sometimes we don't have much of a choice of norms. We just have, maybe there's only one set of norms. But if there are more than one set of norms, do choose which ones to use. 
and you do your report writing and you might or might not give feedback. Most attorneys, if you're doing medical legal work, they don't want you to give your patient feedback. So check that with your attorney before you give feedback and they have their various <laughs> reasons for that. But if it's a um, clinical patient that's referred by a doctor, um, it's always a good idea to give them feedback, I, I believe. When you're planning your assessment, you, you need to plan the overall approach to the problem. You need to request medical documents beforehand so that you can read through them or scan over them at least beforehand so you don't miss something important. You don't want to have tested this person and scored it and so on, and then you read through medical notes and think, oh, I didn't realize that they had a bleed in this particular area. If I'd known that, I would have also done these additional tests. So go through medical documents before. Know what questions you want answered and plan the tests that you're going and then prepare the tests. And which test you use depends on a number of questions. Um, what is a referral question? You know, is it dementia? Is it for um, you know, pre versus post morbid ability and so on? Is it a child or an adolescent or an adult? Because obviously there are different tests for different ages. What is the person's home language? Um, if they are English first language speaking, then we have many tests that we can use. If they're not, then we tend to be limited. So think about that and find out beforehand what their home language is. Um, their general level of intelligence and quality of schooling. You know, if you get somebody who dropped out of school quite early on, you can't give them these complicated tests with complicated instructions. So bear that in mind. Think about previous assessments. I've had a case that I did an assessment only to find out much later that she'd done exactly the same test only about a week before, and she hadn't told me. So um, she was delighted that she was doing so much better on the tests, and I thought, well, she's doing much better than I thought she would, but there was a practice effect. So check if there were previous assessments, and if so, what tests were used. Okay. Well, you're lucky if a patient tells you that, because sometimes they don't. Because they don't always know. I mean, patients don't know that there's going to be a practice effect. What do they know? They're just doing what, they, what everybody tells them to do. So they see one psychologist, see another psychologist. So sometimes they'll mention if they've seen it before, and sometimes they won't. And if there is, you know, it's okay if there's quite a big time difference. If there's six months or more from the time that they were assessed, depending on how bright they are, um, six months or more is probably okay to repeat the test. If they are very, very, very bright, then six months is too little, in my opinion. Then you maybe need to just do other tests. So it is very good if you can find out beforehand if they've been for other tests. Look at the time period. If a person's had a traumatic brain injury, you don't want to test them, and, if, and it's for medical legal um, uh, purposes. You don't want to test them until at least two years have passed because they are still in the process of recovering. Of course, it's very different if you're testing them as part of a rehab, you know, to help them. So you need to also think about why you're testing them. But it's for, if it's for medical legal purposes, at least two years. If it's a stroke patient, there's also a period of recovery. You also need to just think about at what stage are you really testing the person? When, are, when have they really reached a stable medical condition for you to be able to assess them? That's a good question. So the question is, if an, if an attorney sends a patient to you and two years haven't passed since the accident, what do you what do? You do? Um, I sometimes then phone the attorney and say, look, do you realize that this person could still improve? It might be better if you'd rather send them a little bit later. Otherwise, I'm happy to test them now, but do realize that they're likely to improve. Because some of the attorneys don't know that. And um, I think it's just fair to point it out because they might then say, okay, let's rather leave it. Otherwise, they've got to be reassessed later when they've sort of re reached that medically stable condition. Some attorneys say, test them anyway. And then I would write in a report, this person is likely to still have further improved. But sometimes there's a reason why they need them tested earlier. The order of tests is very important. You don't want to, um, for example, do um, something like a way complex figure and then do something else that has also a visio-spatial component where they draw something, and then later you ask them to recall it, because the two are likely to interfere with each other. You're not getting a pure idea of how they would function on the way complex figure on its own. The same for verbal memory test. Try and, if you've got a, a test and a delay that you want to do about half an hour later, try not to put anything in that time period that's going to interfere with their recall. 
Okay. And then you need to look at validity of tests. Now we know that no tests are perfect, but you just need to be aware of to what extent they are valid. So you need, you need to look at the face validity. Does it appear to measure what it's supposed to measure? And ecological validity, does this measure predict behavior in everyday situations? For example, the ability to turn, return to work or their driving ability. It's all good and well they can do something or not do something in your office, but that does, does that relate to reality? So if you read up in Lee Zach and so on, she will give you details about these validity studies, and you just need to be aware of it. As if no test is perfect, but if you're aware of the, the pitfalls and so on, then it just helps you to form a, a, a clear opinion. Now, impairments on measures of executive functioning, intellectual functioning, and memory were the best predictors of employment status. This is just some research that I think is very important. And to determine driving ability in older adults, one needs to have incentive for standard vision screening and assess their speed of processing, visuospatial processing, and memory. Those are just, I just put those in because I think they're, they're quite important. Okay. Now, in addition to deciding which tests to choose for your assessment, you need to look at the reliability. So how regularly will you get the same results under, under the same test conditions? Um, most of the tests that we use, co use commonly are fairly reliable, but again, if, especially if you're using a new test, just read up on the, validity, uh, the reliability studies done it, on it. And how sensitive are the tests? Sensitivity, you get sensitivity and speci specificity. Sensitivity measures the proportion of actual positives which are correctly identified as such. Example, the per percentage of sick people who are correctly identified as having a condition. It's useful for ruling out the presence of a disorder. For example, the verbal paired associates or the Vesham memory scales is very sensitive to dementia. Okay. How specific are the tests? Specific specificity measures the proportion of negatives which are correctly identified. Example, the percentage of healthy people who are correctly identified as not having the condition. It's useful for ruling in the presence of a disorder. For example, a reading test from an aphasia examination is easily passed by literate adults. So someone who does poorly on it has a disorder. Okay. And you need to look at how long is your test battery and to what extent can your patient concentrate. You get some people, particularly if they're in a hospital and let's say you need to do an assessment but it's really early days for them, they might not be able to concentrate for very long at all. Or let's say you've got a very elderly patient coming in for, let's say, a dementia assessment. Maybe they also can't concentrate for too long or they just lack the stamina. So you need to be aware of that. If necessary, you might need to split your assessment up into more than one day. Um, or otherwise, see if you can keep it as, as short as possible. Remember that time and cost need to be considered. So you can't do this lengthy assessment on this person just because you want to. Um, it costs them money. It costs the attorney's money, it costs the government money, whatever. You've got to, from an ethical point of view, you mustn't test them longer than they need to be tested. Obviously within reason. But you just use your clinical judgment to decide that. But you can't test them for three days solid just because you want to do every test that you possibly have on them. Okay. And it's really helpful to, when you start your assessment, to start with something that's easy so that they, you can ease them into it and to end off with something easy so that they, they feel reasonably good when they leave. Now, only psychologists may do psychological tests. And I'm, I've put this slide in because the Psychometrics Committee of the Professional Board of Psychology in our country is on a mission to try and stop other professions using psychological tests. And we know that often that is the case. And psychological tests, by, by definition, are tests that test psychological constructs. Okay. And if you see that it is happening, they've actually asked that you just send an email to them or you go onto their website and, and just put in, just mention it to them. They will then take it up with a relative professional to say, look, you're not really allowed to use this test. It's a psychological test. Okay. We have an ethical responsibility about that. Now, your examination room. One doesn't always test the patient in an examination room. Sometimes you've got to go to hospital or go see them at home sometimes. But if you do have an examination room, which is very nice, there's certain things you need to take into consideration. Your desk must be clear. 
you can't have it cluttered with other files and books and things like that. It needs to be clear so that they're not distracted. You must try and limit the noise. Try and have a room without distractions. But as I've said before, if there are distractions, let's say somebody walks outside of your door and sneezes or something like that, and you can hear from inside of your room. It's not the end of the world. If anything, you can actually use that qualitatively. You know, did your patient respond? Did they hear it? Did they turn? Were they distracted? How long did it take them to focus again on the task? So you can use that information qualitatively. But as far as possible, try and be without distractions. Have natural light to the, to the, the best of your ability. Um, in my office, I have um, a fluorescent light and natural light. Sometimes the fluorescent light flashes and I switch it off because you know that people who have epilepsy are very sensitive to flashing lights. So um, try and have natural light as well. And I think with the load shedding, it's also really helpful to have a room with a window. Okay. Um, don't have any clocks or watches visible in the room. Not for your patient to see because often you want to ask them orientation questions. What is the date? What is the time? You don't want them looking at the clock over your shoulder. Okay, so you can have a clock over their shoulder, but they mustn't see it. Um, so calendars, newspapers in the waiting room, try to have all date-related things out of the way. Make sure it's not too hot or too cold in the room. Your room needs to be wheelchair accessible. You need to have a waiting room because sometimes you have people that come for collateral interviews and they need somewhere where they can wait. It must be safe. And the examiner has to be dressed appropriately. And I can't stress this enough. You know, um, modestly dressed, but also don't have any, if you're testing someone, don't have any flashy earrings, something that sparkles, or, you know, necklace that shines. Because it can, particularly with children or somebody who's just easily distractible, it can take their attention off what they're really trying to do. So just bear that in mind. You need to prepare your client before you test them. Does the client know about the purpose of the assessment? You can't just test a person without their consent. It needs to be informed consent. They need to know what the purpose of the assessment is and what's going to happen to that information. And they need to give consent on that basis. Agree on payment before the first appointment. Don't surprise them with the shock of what it's going to cost once they're actually in there. Um, send messages beforehand about medication, about getting enough sleep, about eating breakfast. Uh, you don't want them to be hungry at the rooms. I think many of us, though, we, we assess patients who come from far away and they are hungry. So I know a number of psychologists who, who keep um, soup or sandwiches or something there that they need to feed, particularly if it's a child. You need to just feed them. You can't concentrate on an empty, empty stomach. If it's a child that's from Brazil and they want to test a patient, That's a good question. If a child is, is, is on Ritalin and you want to test for their attention, should they be on a Ritalin or should they not? I have thought this through so many times. And all I can say is, ideally, you should test them twice, once on Ritalin, once without. But, of course, I think in practice that's not always that easy, but ideally, because what, otherwise you, you, you don't really know. Okay. Um, ask them to bring school reports. You need to get collateral information. Often it's helpful if that person comes along. Otherwise, you need to get telephone numbers for that person. You need a translator if necessary. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. Um, explain what will happen in the information and get informed written consent. If you're seeing a child, ideally you need to get consent from both parents. That's not always that easy. So if you really can't, then that's all right. One parent will suffice, but you have to try to get it from both parents. Um, if the client can't give informed consent, let's say the person is so far with dementia, they're delusional or they really don't understand what's going on, then they can't give informed consent. So then you need to ask yourself, is there somebody else who you can get consent from? And that's a very difficult question because it's a difficult legal, ethical question. Who do you then ask permission from on that behalf of that person? The next of kin is probably... Is, is reasonable solution. Um, it helps if one can give questionnaires out beforehand to get background information, but sometimes our clients can't read it or can't understand it, so it depends on the client that you've got. You need to um, ask the patient to say in their words what their problems are. You need to ex explain to them what to expect from the assessment. Always try, tell them to try their best because they don't always realize that they're not really supposed to try their best. 
And also, if it's a time test and they have to work quickly, remind them that they have to work quickly. Don't assume that they're going to work as quickly as they can. Um, in some cultures, it's, it's better to go slowly and carefully than quickly. So if it's a time test, you might just need to remind them, this you have to do as quickly as you can. You need to discuss whether or not there will be a feedback session and whether or not they will receive a copy of the report. Remember, the attorneys also don't want, always want you to give the patient a copy of your report. I'm not going to go through the slide. These are just the various things that you need to go through during the interview, information that you need to get. Um, in terms of estimating pre-morbid ability, if that is necessary, it's not always necessary, but the vocabulary subtests of, for example, the Vishla Adult Intelligence Scales is a very good and well-established, um, it correlates very highly with level of education before the accident. And the picture completion test, along with the vocabulary, are two of the sturdiest tests. The average of the two, or the highest of the two, if one is markedly lower, could be the, could be the estimated pre-morbid IQ score. Very useful to in, always include the picture completion of the Vishla Adult Intelligence Scale and the vocabulary, bearing in mind the person's level of education for the vocabulary. The information subtest and the vocabulary subtest from the Vishla Adult Intelligence Scale is very good for estimating pre-morbid verbal intelligence and full-scale intelligence. Block design, picture completion, and object assembly has given the best estimate of pre-morbid um, non-verbal IQ, performance IQ. Okay. So include those in your test battery if that's the information you're needing. You also get other tests of pre-morbid ability, like the NART and the Vishla test of adult reading, where they look at, there's a list of words that the person has to read, and you know, and you're looking at their pronunciation of the words. So the words aren't, it's not clear from the way the word is written how to pronounce it. You need to have been exposed to that word, or have heard it, or have read it, to know how to pronounce the word. So it's a good indicator of pre-morbid intellectual ability because your intellectually more able people would have read wider, would have encountered those words more often. You can also look at demogra demographic variables, um, like whether they're urban or rural residents, what the occupation was beforehand, ethnic group, and geographic region. And um, in, with the, with the Wishler test of adult reading, you can use a combination of word recognition with the demographics, demographics to get an even better picture. There's a best performance method that you'll read about in LISAC. It's not always all that well respected, but it is something to consider if you don't have any other uh, ability to look for um, pre-morbid or ability to estimate pre-morbid ability. Memory is the least reliable indicator of general cognitive ability beforehand and your level of education and historical background is important. Okay. Now, while you're busy assessing the patient, so I know I'm going through this quickly, but there's quite a lot of information. As I said, it's, much of it is pretty much um, kind of obvious. Right. Yes. So that they're trying to establish the pre-morbid ability of a very young child. It's very difficult. Yes. If, if they are school going age, you'd at least have the school re records, which helps. If they haven't been to school yet, you're looking at mainly the, the parents, their, what level of education they achieved and what their working history is. So if you're looking at parents who all have doctorates and they are um, medical doctors, and you know, so then you can, that child probably had quite a high intellectual pre-morbid ability. If you're looking at parents that dropped out of school in grade six and have been doing odd labor sort of related work, then that child probably had a lower pre-morbid ability. You, you have, look, that's it, probably. You still don't know exactly, but you're looking at probabilities. And... Um, Something else to take into consideration is that 64% of our population fall in the average range. So if you really have no other indicator, chances are, better than none, that they fell in the average range. 
Okay. So you have to look at all, you've t taken a number of things into consideration. You need to look at the birth of the child, look, if there's an APGAR score, if you can get hold of birth records and their clinic card and so on, look at the APGAR score, were they okay when they were born, look at um, the chart of their development, you know, did they, were they strong, healthy children, were they sickly children, you look at as much as you can. You often can't rely on the history of the mother. She will, you know, she, unless she's just very tuned into that child, she's probably not going to know if the child sat at the right time and spoke at the right time and walked at the right time and so on. It helps get, the, get that information. You need to ask for it, but you can't rely on it. Sometimes it helps to, for example, get the granny in, the granny who's already raised children and is more, maybe more tuned into so little children. It has an emotional distance from the, a little bit more of an emotional distance from the child to maybe be a better judge of how the child is developing as a baby. Okay. Good point. One can also look at the progress of the other siblings. So find out how the other sibling is doing at school. Um, do you have report cards for them? Okay. And if the child is in preschool, you can speak to the preschool teacher. But she deals a lot with children, so she'll be able to compare how that child compared with the others. Okay. Um, so what you are observing in your patient, you're looking at their gait. How do they walk when they're walking into your room? Do they have a shuffling gait? Um, you know, and um, what does that tell you about it? Sometimes they don't have a gait, they're in a wheelchair. Okay, and that's, that's significant. Their speech, do they speak very quickly or very slowly? Is there dysarthria? Dysarthria is not being able to speak because of problems with the, the muscles and the tongue and so on. Are they clear? What's their vocabulary like? Circumlocution, do they talk around the point instead of, instead of getting to the point? Do they repeat themselves? Um, how are they dressed? Are they clean? Are they, do, do, they, do they look dis disheveled? Or are they, you know, and um, you might need to ask, you know, if it's somebody, let's say, who has, is very far with a dementia and they're looking very well dressed and so on, you might just want to ask their spouse who dressed this person. Did the spouse dress him or her? Um, what is their attitude like? Are they cooperative? Are they negative? Are they fearful? And their emotions, are they tearful? Do they have bluntness? Are they suspicious? Are they anxious? Are they depressed? Are they inappropriate? Um, what's their frustration tolerance like? And are they putting in enough effort? Or are they really just not feeling like this assessment? Or maybe even deliberately trying to look worse than they are? Um, you form a hypothesis and then you ask, you, do, while you're busy testing, you, you're busy checking your hypothesis. You might mid-assessment suddenly decide to add in some tests or take out some tests as you go along, depending on your hypothesis. Regarding translators and interpreters, this is a very difficult thing that we have to deal with in South Africa. Well, not only in South Africa, I think all over the world. You have people that you're trying to assess who doesn't speak your language and you don't speak theirs, you need to get an interpreter in. Be very careful with that. Be aware of using casual interpreters like family members and friends because they are going to be biased, probably. Okay? They are more likely to try and help the person. Um, and also be, be careful of naive interpreters who don't understand what psychometric assessment is about and that there are limits in how much they need to help a person and um, that there are certain things that you need to, if somebody says something, they need to tell you what they've said because it might be of significance in your findings even if it doesn't seem that way to the interpreter. Ideally, one needs to have somebody that you use often that you can train to, you know, train in what you're doing so they get an understanding of what you're doing. Um, that, though, in itself is a problem because ethically, only psychologists may be exposed to the psychological tests. So um, I had this wonderful idea at one stage, I'm going to train up a psychometrist to help me, but psychometrists are not allowed to do neuropsychological testing. So you can't use a psychometrist, um, and you can't really expose the test to people who aren't registered to health professionals, counsel, except your patient. It's, it's really quite a vexed question. Um, yes. Yes. It's very, it's very difficult. Um, I, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've managed to find myself an interpreter. I'm holding on to her for dear life. She's one of the um, students, one of the neuropsychology students at UCT, and she's causa speaking. 
and um, she's brilliant because she will say to me, um, I asked him this question, but I don't think he understood because this is what he said. So now I'm thinking of simplifying it and asking it in this way. Is that all right? Yes, please. And then she'll say that and she'll say, okay, he says this and that and that. Wow. So, you know, if one can find somebody like that, they're worth gold. They really are. It's very difficult. The other thing that with problem with interpreters is that it throws out the validity of the test. And you can't get around that. It does. Because now you are giving the instruction in English, and then the interpreter is giving the instruction in that person's language. Now, they might have some understanding of English. So now they're hearing the instructions twice. Okay? Also, even, even if they didn't, just that being in a different language invalidates the test. But that doesn't mean that the information you get from the test is worthless. There's still important information you get from it. And once again, you're looking at it in the context of what happened to this person. What, are, what is the person's complaint? What is the collateral information saying? You're looking at the bigger picture and seeing if you can fit it in. Okay. Because otherwise, we just wouldn't be able to test anybody who speaks a language other than English. No, one has to work around it. And that is also why you need good clinical judgment and a good understanding of neuropsychology, neuropathology, neuroanatomy. All right, so to try and get the best from your client, because when you're testing a patient, you need them to be cooperative. Okay? If they're kicking against you, they don't want to be test, tested, you're not going to get the best out of them. So you need to try and strike a rapport. And you give continual support and encouragement without indicating whether they've been correct or wrong in giving an answer. So you can't say, yes, that's right. Um, you've got to just say, I'm glad you're doing so well. And just, you're doing well, just keep going. And um, So you can't let them know whether they've done it right or wrong, but just keep encouraging them. Maintain a relaxed conversational flow throughout the assessment without permitting it to interrupt the test administration. So... I can't remember if it's Lizak or another book where they talk about prattle. You sort of talk, 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 talk. You know, while you're busy getting the next test ready, you talk about the weather and you talk about the, this and that and what a nice scarf you have on today and blah, blah, blah. And just to help a person feel comfortable. Okay. If you're very stern and strict and quiet, the person's going to be, get more tense. You want them to be relaxed. Try and limit distractions, as I said. Take into account the time of the day. Always try and do your testing in the morning. Sometimes it's not possible, I realize. But if you're not doing the testing in the morning, you need to indicate that you did the testing in the afternoon and this person might not have been the best. Okay, they're better in the morning. And look for fatigue. It may be necessary to repeat the instructions or even paraphrase them. We were talking about that earlier. Sometimes the test instructions are so long and you know your client, is, by the time you got to the end of giving the test instructions, they've forgotten the beginning. Now, listen to what Lizak says. The meaning of the instructions should be the same for all people rather than the wording. You want them to understand what they need to do. The exact words that you use is less important. If you know the person's going to understand the instructions that you, as it is exactly in the test, you give it exactly in the test. But sometimes you just know this person's not going to understand it that way. And it's important that they understand what to do rather than you have reading verbatim the test instructions. Okay, they come from Lizak. And um, look out for poor effort. You've always got to be on your guard. You know, is this person trying to exaggerate? I read statistics, I think, yesterday where they said something like 50% of people that come for assessments for medical negligence purposes or um, personal injury claims, 50% tend to exaggerate their symptoms. doesn't mean that they're completely being dishonest or something, but they just put a bit of an edge on it. They just make it sound a little bit worse than, they, than it really was, and maybe their effort isn't so good. Sometimes, quite frankly, sometimes people blatantly are dishonest and um, exaggerate. Of course, also if it's like a medical negligence claim or a personal injury claim, people tend to fake that they're worse, that they are, that they're going to be faking. Often, if it's like a um, custody matter, they're going to fake good. They're going to pretend to be much better than they are. They're such a good mother. They're such a good father. Okay. Um, common assessment problems with brain disorders. 
sometimes a person is just not alert. You can't test somebody. You can't do a test battery if they're not alert. Okay, then you need to reschedule it for when they are alert. They might have attention deficits, deficits, memory disorders. They might not remember the instructions so well. Might get tired. They might be on medication that affects them. They might be in pain. So you need to be aware of that. If you see them wincing, you need to ask them, are you in pain? Because it's going to affect their concentration. They might not be motivated. They might be anxious, experience stress or distress. They might be depressed, frustrated. They might be executive function difficulties, and they might be hungry. And this is something in South Africa, as I said, in particular we need to be aware of. Ask the person, please ask the person if they've eaten something. Because a lot of our people come and they're hungry and it doesn't occur to them that they're not supposed to be hungry to do the assessment. So do ask them. And have something ready that you can give to them if they are hungry. Now, in choosing norms, you need to find the most appropriate norms. It would be ideal if you find norms for exactly that age group, exactly that level of education, exactly that area of the country and so on, but it doesn't always work that way. So if you don't have a right, exactly the right fit of norms, try to compare across the norms that you do have to see if there may, there's a significant difference. So let's say I have a certain person, certain age, I've done a certain test, and I have norms from the UK, and I have norms from Australia. Um, compare it and see, you know, uh, or let's say uh, what is sort of more likely in our country. Let's say we have UK norms, and we have norms for causa speaking people from very disadvantaged backgrounds. But the person you're testing is someone who's going to a private school and so on. So then you compare the two. You're very lucky if you find that they fall in the same category. Then you know what you've found. But if there's a very big difference, you just need to apply your mind to it clinically. And there are three books that I can recommend. I'm sure there are others. And please tell me if you're aware of others. But these are really three books that all psychologists, I believe, should have. Um, Lizak, by the way, this is her fourth edition. You get a, a fifth edition now. Um, so this is Lizak's book, Neuropsychological Assessment. This one, A Compendium of Neuropsychological Tests, is brilliant. It's got, it lists a whole lot of norms. And this one by Mitrashina, normative, normative Data for Neuropsychological Assessment, also has very useful norms in. Yeah, this is, this is um, the older version was by Spreen and Strauss. This one's by Strauss, Sherman, and Spreen. If you want to get the exact, refer exact references, just email me. I'll send them to you. It has a lot of the old norms in the old book and then some additional ones. Now, when you're measuring pre versus post morbid functioning, you, you're measuring deficit, okay? And you need to compare it to the estimated pre morbid functioning. Um, if only one descriptive category higher or lower than, ex than expected is not significant, let's say. You, you, you worked it out, and this person functioned in the average range. Now you're testing them. They're functioning in the low average range. That is not significant. Okay. Um, if there are more than two standard deviations difference, then there's a significant difference, or um, two category description differences. So let's say you think the person was average. Now you find them in the borderline range. That's significant. Okay. If you find, um, if there's a one or two standard deviation difference, it suggests a trend. Okay. So again, you apply yourself, your clinical mind, to what that trend might be as a result of. Okay. But certainly, if there's more than two standard deviations or more than two category descriptions difference, then there's a significant difference. So let's say you, the person had an estimated superior pre morbid functioning, and now there's functioning in the average range, that's significant. It's significantly low for that person, even though they're now functioning in the average range. You, you, if, you, if you look at an IQ test and you've got your, like your full-scale IQ and your verbal, your non-verbal, those numbers are actually in, unimportant or, or not much use for us as neuropsychologists. Much more important are your subtests. And so if you're expecting your person performed more or less in the average range, and now on one or two subtests they're doing this borderline range, that is significant. And then you need to look at, does that compare medically, anatomically, with what happened to the person and the, from a pathology pattern point of view? Okay. Now, 
my opinion, this is my opinion, okay. Um, try not to use, um, okay, use words such as average and high average to make sense of the scores rather than just using percentiles and so on because remember when you write a report, you write it for three people. You're writing it for the attorney, if there's an attorney, or the doctor, okay, whoever referred the patient, you're writing it for them. You're writing it for the patient themselves and you're writing it for any other neuropsychologist who might want to assess this person again in the future. So when you're writing for the attorney and the doctor, you need to be clear on what you are actually saying, what you found about this patient. For the patient itself, you need to, be, you need, you need to use lay terms. They need to understand, don't use these high, difficult prosopagnosias and so on. Be very clear, you have facial recognition difficulty. Use lay terms. And even for the attorneys as well. And then because this person might be reassessed in the future by another neuropsychologist, you need to put in the scores. So remember, you, it's for those three people. So, but if you're using terms like average and high average, different people use it differently. So what I recommend is that at the end of your report, include a table that shows what you mean by high average or low average or superior or very superior. Okay. And try not to use mixed descriptions, such as in one report you'll talk about above average and high average. Because the lay person's not going to understand that. What's the difference between above average and a high average? The one is above. How high above? Very high above? So be very clear in what the terms that you use. And I'll say then put in a table, something similar to this, that you're getting these at, saying what you mean by your descriptions. Okay. And then make use of percentiles or Z scores if, if, for the sake of the other neuropsychologists in the future. Um, this is what I mentioned earlier. If a score is over-inclusive, like an IQ score, it's actually meaningless to us as neuropsychologists. doesn't mean you shouldn't put it into your report because it's meaningful to some other people, like the attorneys. They're quite like looking at what, what the person's IQ is now. Some of it's more meaningful to them than it is to us, but they ask for it, okay? Or at least I've had attorneys asking that you put it in. And it's important to observe how a client takes a test besides just the scores. You know, what types of mistakes do they make? That gives us a lot of information. And also remember that each neuropsychological test measures more than one aspect of brain functioning. So for example, digit symbol coding, it measures processing speed, um, reading ability for numbers and letters, visual scanning ability, fine motor functioning, some abstract reasoning, um, being able to remember instructions and sequencing. So just because they do bad, you know, don't assume it's because of just one reason. You need to bear in mind all the things that each test is testing so that you can find the patterns. Just for, for um, those who don't know, um, okay, you, you know you, this table you'll find in LISAC. Okay, you'll find it in me, most books. You'll find it in Sabrina Strauss as well. You can use percentiles or you can use Z-scores. I quite like using Z-scores. I try to stay away from percentiles because I find lay people misunderstand it. Um, so they think if you, if you have a 50th percentile, then it's like 50% and you've actually done quite badly, which isn't the case. It's in the average range. Okay. So I like using Z-scores. And just a reminder, to calculate your Z-score, you take your score for the test minus the mean. You know, mostly when we get our norms, they'll tell you what the mean and the standard deviation is. So you take your score minus the mean, divided by the standard deviation, and that gives you your Z-score. And if you can work out all of your scores to Z-scores, it just makes it so much clearer for anybody who's trying to read your report afterwards. And you can find tables in LISAC, in Spring and Strauss, that convert Z-scores to percent oh, percentiles to Z-scores as well. So there's no excuse to not have Z-scores in your report. Now, I want to point something out here that is also I've noticed in a lot of psychologists' reports is a lot of confusion about certain things. Now, I need to think carefully how to explain this because I don't always explain it very well. If you compare this table, okay, here's your bell curve, all right. This section here in the middle is between minus one standard deviation and plus one standard deviation. This table here as well has this section in the middle. 
This section here in the middle is what we call the average range. But look where your minus one standard deviation is and your plus one standard deviation. Okay. Your average range isn't from exactly minus one standard deviation to plus one standard deviation. So the lower you get to, the, the closer you get to just before minus one standard deviation, you're actually not average anymore, you're in the lower average range. And the best way to actually go about working out this is by using your z-scores. Calculate your z-score and then compare it to the IQ ranges, um, the descrip descriptions that they use, the average, high average, superior, very superior. All right. Um, if you have any questions about this, please email me because I know I don't always explain it all that well. All right. Now, if you give feedback, um, some people give feedback before they finalize their report. To give feedback, see what does a person think about what they're finding, did they maybe miss something, is there extra information they need to put in, and then they finalize their report. I tend to want to give them the report when I, when I've, when I see them for feedback, so that it's not necessary for them to come back again. Um, try and describe when you give feedback, the positives and negatives. You don't want to give them all bad news, okay? And this is according to Lezak, and I do tend to agree. Don't elaborate on more than three cognitive deficits. So let's say this person ha is, has so many cognitive deficits. Choose three that you want to focus on. You don't want to overwhelm the person by how poorly they're performing, okay? Because remember, we're psychologists. We're here to help people. We're here to help them feel better and enjoy their life and be happy and so on. So if you're bombarding them with everything that's wrong with them, um, it could actually cause harm rather than good. So just be careful of that. I have always found that by, by being completely honest about the findings, um, they can relate to it and they, they feel that because they understand themselves better and somebody else understands them now, they actually feel quite good about that. But always, always mention the things that are still intact. Just because you have a memory difficulty doesn't mean that you can no longer play music or ride your bicycle or whatever. Okay. Be honest but compassionate and allow questions. Oh, and also try to get them to relate to what you're saying in real life. Because the more you, you, know, you say, look, I found you really struggled with this. Um, that, can you get, think of any examples in real life that, you know, that might show this in real life? And it gives them an opportunity to talk about what they're experiencing. And again, it's that just feeling heard and um, that, that helps a person. Okay, these are just some points on report writing that you can read through. I don't need to go through them because I see I'm running out of time. More on report writing, the things you need to include and not include. Okay, let's talk about court work quickly. Um, the most important point if you go to court is that you're there to help the court. You're not there to help the referring attorney. You're there to help the court, the judge, to understand, the magistrate to understand what is going on. Um, Expert witnesses are expected to have knowledge and skill expected in the field they purport to be an expert in. So if you say you're an expert in neuropsychologist, you better be an expert in neuropsychologist. If you're, if you, if you're not saying you're an expert, but you're saying you're, you're learning to become, you know, you're interested in neuropsychology, you're training yourself up in neuropsychology, that's fine, because you're not saying you're an expert in it. If you say you're an expert, they're going to expect you to be an expert. Um, working on a contingency basis is unethical. I'm going to go through this quite quickly, right? Your clinical opinion is not worth anything without good evidence for it. You can't just say, that's my opinion, that's my clinical opinion, it's meaningless. You've got to say, why? What informed that opinion? Assume all reports you write are going to court. Even if you're not doing a medical legal case, it doesn't matter. All reports you do, assume they're going to end up in court. Um, use various sources of information to form a global opinion, like your medical documents, complaints, etc. If, they, if, they, if you say you're an expert in the field, they can easily point something out that you don't know, and they can say, but you said you're an expert. If you say, I have a lot of expertise in this, I have a lot of experience in this, and this is why, and here's my CV, they'll be happy with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, my, my opinion was formed by the information available to me at that time. Yeah, something like that. 
so that because often it does happen in court that something comes out that you didn't know about and it would make you think differently about it and then you just need to say okay well look that's new to me I just need to go and think about that okay don't ever feel pressured to make to check to sort of give an opinion on the spot if you need time to think about it they must give you time to think about it mm -hmm. if you need time to go and read up more about it or get more collateral information whatever they've got to give you that time okay <laughs> Um, don't move outside of your personal field of expertise, ever, because you're going to get caught. And admit if you don't know. We don't know everything. So if there's something to ask you and you don't know, just say, that's not something I have knowledge about. Um, if you want me to, I can go and find out more about it, but it's not something I have knowledge about at the moment. Or this is not within my field of expertise. They might ask you a medical question um, or about the, uh, what career this person might have followed. And that's not within your field of expertise unless you're an industrial psychologist. Okay, I can just say that's not in, in my field of expertise. And it's not because they're trying to necessarily trick you. They just need to know what can they trust of what you're saying. Um, lack of full understanding of a subject does not render useless all factor and opinion on that matter. Okay, so you don't have to know everything about everything. But then just have it within context. You know, I know this because of this, so that's why I think that. Okay. Work under supervision until you feel secure in your assessments. Even once you feel confident in your expertise, make use of supervision if you're feeling uncertain in any particular case. We do get some curveballs sometimes, and you just want to just talk to a colleague about it and say, look, what do you think of this? Am I coming to the right conclusion? Am I off track here? All right. In court, prepare for court appearances by going through your and other reports related to the case thoroughly beforehand. Um, dress neatly, be respectful and polite to all participants. Um, be objective, you may not choose sides, you're there to help the court. You're not there to defend the patient or whatever. You're there to help the court get an objective point of view. Um, use the words possible, which is less than 50% chance, and probable, which is more than 50% chance correctly. So if you're saying it's probably the case, you must know that you are meaning 50% or more. Okay. Think carefully before you speak, and do not be shy to ask for a moment to think a question through. Um, don't rush into giving an answer. Ask for questions to be repeated or clarified if you did not understand them clearly. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm not quite sure what you're, what you're asking me. Would you mind rephrasing it or repeating it? Be prepared to explain technical jargon in layman's terms because the judge is not going to understand the technical neuropsychological terms, or probably not. Be patient and flexible with your time. It is difficult for participants to predict exactly when and for how long the court will need you. So, and I've heard that this is a great frustration. The psychologist saying, I'm only available in the morning till this time. I say, please, please. We don't know when the court is going to need you. Just be flexible and patient. Okay. Um, if you find yourself forced to say yes or no about something, but you feel that further clarification is necessary, you may ask the judge to clarify the issue. Okay. Back up your opinion with facts and or careful reasoning. Um, keep control of your emotions. Okay. Um, do not take any documentation into the witness box with you because then everybody wants it and it has to be dispersed. Okay. Your, they will have a copy of your report in the witness box along with the other reports. That is what you refer to. If you take anything with you, it has to, everyone has to get a copy of it. And there could be ethical issues with that. Um, take psychometric test manuals to court with you in case you need to refer to them. Example regarding the validity and reliability of the test. I was so glad the first time I heard this actually being said. I thought I had to keep in my head all the validity and reliability statistics, all the tests that you use, and I find it so anxiety provoking. But you just take the manuals with you, and if they ask you about validity and reliability of the test, you say, I don't know it, but I have the, doc the manual here if you give me a moment to go, to go find it. Okay. Do not speak to anybody except your attorney or your advocate if you're taking a break while still under oath in evidence in chief. Once under cross-examination, do not speak to anybody at all. So if you're on the witness box um, and there's a break, a tea break, they like their tea breaks and so on, um, you can speak to your attorney or your advocate during break, nobody else. But if you're under cross-examination, you may not speak to anybody. You just sit in your little witness box and drink your tea and you wait for the break to be over.
Okay. Always direct your answers and questions to the judge. We're speaking to him. He's the one who needs to know. Address the judge as my lord or my lady, if there is a male or female judge, respectively. Watch the speed of the judge's writing and pace your speech accordingly. So if you've got a lot to say and the judge is trying to write it down, just pause, wait for him to catch up. Okay, they can get very frustrated if you're going too fast. Admit as soon as possible if you have formed a new opinion or realize that you've made a mistake. Don't go along trying to save face and trying to convince them that you're actually right when you've realized you've made a mistake. We're human. We make mistakes. The sooner you just say what the mistake is or that you're reconsidering, the better. Remember, you're there to help the court. Okay. Remain committed to the very end of the process, so don't go and leave the country if you know there's a, you know, something that hasn't been finalized. Don't lose your temper. Um, before attempting medical legal work, ensure that you have the required expertise. And if you cannot remain committed to the very end of the medical legal process because you'll be retiring or immigrating, for example, don't take on the case. And then my final word, don't guess. Please don't guess. If you don't know, it's okay to not know. You can say, um, for this and this reason, one can't say for sure, but don't take a guess and then try and back up your guess, okay? Don't follow theories or use tests without sound research basis. One gets many funny theories and things going along. Unless you've actually read it in research and you can back it up, don't just say it because you think it's true because that's the common knowledge. Okay, we have a lot of sort of things that are supposedly common knowledge that are not true. Stay up to date with the newest findings. If you can, that's not so easy, but to the extent that you can, regularly attend workshops, conferences, and meetings such as the SACNA regional meetings. By the newest editions of tests, where applicable, where applicable, sometimes it's not relevant to buy the newest test. You've got South African norms on the one test, not on the new test. You know, so think it through. Understand the applicability of the test for particular patients and research suspected diagnoses and differential diagnoses. If you're not sure, you know, you haven't, you've got a patient, you think they might have a certain disorder, you haven't thought it through for a long time, you haven't read about it for a long time, just go, take the time, go research it, go look it up, go get more information on it. And that is your reading for this coming month. It is a lot. This time you've, you've actually really got a lot. You've got a number of chapters, right? Um, so try and do all of that before I see you again and catch up on anything outstanding. Because the next time I see you is the 4th of September for the tutorial, and then you, own, you have less than a month before the exam. Okay. What I'm going to do in the last tutorial, I'm going to go through some of the articles that you need to go through for the exam, and just tying up a few loose ends. Uh, I'm not going to have an overwhelming amount that you have to study after my next tutorial. Okay, just a few articles. So thank you very much. <laughs>